Mosiah teaches principles of good government and warns his people of the dangers of having a king. The people heed his counsel and appoint judges to be their political leaders, with Alma the Younger as chief judge. Alma the Younger serves as chief judge and high priest. He combats priestcraft among the people. Amalekai seeks to be king but is rejected by the voice of the people. He and his followers join with the Lamanites, mark their foreheads red, and wage war against the believing Nephites. Church members prosper but become prideful. Alma resigns the judgment seat to devote himself to the ministry. Speaking behaviorally, when what was once the lesser voice of the people becomes more dominant, then the judgments of God and the consequences of foolish selfishness follow. Cultural decline is accelerated when single interest segments of society become indifferent to general values once widely shared. This drift is facilitated by the indifferent or the indulgent as society is led carefully down to hell. Some may not join in this drift, but instead they step aside, whereas once they might have constrained, as is their representative right. We actually have an obligation to notice genuine telltale societal signs. For what happens in cultural decline, both leaders and followers are really accountable. Historically, of course, it's easy to criticize bad leaders, but we should not give followers a free pass. Otherwise, in their rationalization of their degeneration, they may say they were just following orders while the leader was just ordering followers. However, much more is required of followers in a democratic society, wherein individual character matters so much in both leaders and followers. President Boyd K. Packer, the virtue of tolerance has been distorted and elevated to a position of such prominence as to be thought equal to and even valued more than morality. It is one thing to be tolerant, even forgiving of individual conduct. It is quite another to collectively legislate and legalize to protect immoral conduct that can weaken, even destroy the family. There is a dangerous trap when tolerance is exaggerated to protect the rights of those whose conduct endangers the family and injures the rights of the more part of the people. We are getting dangerously close to the condition described by the prophet Mosiah. Tolerance is defined as a friendly and fair attitude toward unfamiliar opinions and practices or toward the persons who hold or practice them. As modern transportation and communication have brought all of us into closer proximity to different peoples and different ideas, we have greater need for tolerance. When I was a young adult, about 60 years ago, it was only in books and magazines that most Americans were exposed to great differences in cultures, values, and people. Now we experience such differences in television and the Internet, through travel, and often in personal interactions in our neighborhoods and the marketplace. This greater exposure to diversity both enriches our lives and complicates them. We are enriched by associations with different peoples, which remind us of the wonderful diversity of the children of God. But diversities in cultures and values also challenge us to identify what can be embraced as consistent with our gospel culture and values and what cannot. In this way, diversity increases the potential for conflict and requires us to be more thoughtful about the nature of tolerance. All persons are brothers and sisters under God, taught within their various religions to love and do good to one another. Relying on the teachings of the Quran, Dr. Shihab continued, quote, We must respect this God-given dignity in every human being, even in our enemies. 
For the goal of all human relations, whether they are religious, social, political, or economic, ought to be cooperation and mutual respect." End of quote. This living with differences is what the gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us we must do. We must seek tolerance from those who hate us for not being of the world. As part of this, we will sometimes need to challenge laws that would impair our freedom to practice our faiths, doing so in reliance on our constitutional rights to the free exercise of religion. We must also practice tolerance and respect toward others. As the Apostle Paul taught, Christians should follow after the things that make for peace, and as much as possible live peaceably with all men. Consequently, we should be alert to honor the good we should see in all people and in many opinions and practices that differ from our own. As the Book of Mormon teaches, all things which are good cometh of God. Wherefore, everything which inviteth and enticeth to do good and to love God and to serve Him is inspired of God. Wherefore, take heed that ye do not judge that which is good to be of, and of God to be of the devil." End of quote. That approach to differences will yield tolerance and also respect. Before King Mosiah died, the Nephites chose judges to lead them. Alma the Younger became the first chief judge. He was also the leader of the church. A large, strong man named Nahor began teaching lies. He said everyone would be saved whether they were good or bad. Many people believed Nahor. Nahor preached against God's church, but a righteous man named Gideon defended it. Nahor argued with Gideon, but Gideon spoke with the words of God. Nahor became angry and drew his sword and killed Gideon. Nahor was taken to Alma to be judged. Nahor boldly defended himself. But Alma said Nahor was guilty because he had taught the people to be wicked and had killed Gideon. Alma said Nahor had to be punished for killing Gideon. According to the law, Nahor must die. Nahor was taken to a nearby hill and put to death. Before he died, he said everything he had taught was wrong, but many people still believed Nahor's evil teachings. These people loved riches and would not obey God's commandments. They made fun of the church members and argued and fought with them. The righteous people continued to obey the commandments and did not complain even when Nahor's followers hurt them. The church members shared everything they had with the poor, and they cared for the sick. They obeyed the commandments, and God blessed them. I tend to have different scriptures that I enjoy um, as I find myself in different chapters of my life. And so there's one in 1 Nephi chapter 8 that uh, has stuck out to me. Um, as I'm now a father of older children, um, as opposed to younger children. First Nephi chapter eight, we're talking about the, the iron rod and the dream where they're moving towards the tree of life. And some people decide not to take it or pointing and mocking at them. And there's one verse that says in verse 31, it says, and he also saw other multitudes feeling their way towards that great and spacious building. And as I read it, it struck me that, you know, I really have to lead by example and I can't lead you guys down paths that don't lead to happiness. And I want to be able to say that you don't know those paths that'll lead you to things that will hurt you or ultimately lead you to sadness and sorrow and gnashing of teeth and all those things that I don't want for you. So that kind of stuck out to me that, you know, paths are important and I hope that as a family, we're all walking on the same path. From your position on the road of life, you young men have many miles to go and many choices to make as you seek to return to our Heavenly Father. Along the road, there are many signs that beckon. Satan is the author of some of these invitations. He seeks to confuse and deceive us, 
to get us on a low road that leads away from our eternal destination. In the beginning, when a powerful spirit was cast down for rebellion, he became Satan, the devil, the father of all lies, to deceive and to blind men and to lead them captive at his will. He and the spirits who follow him are still deceiving the world. Modern revelation declares that Satan hath sought to deceive you, that he might overthrow you. Satan's methods of deception are enticing, music, movies, and other media, and the glitter of a good time. When Satan's lies succeed in deceiving us, we become vulnerable to his power. Here are some ways the devil will try to deceive us. God's commandments and the teachings of his prophets warn against each of them. One kind of deception seeks to mislead us about who we should follow. In speaking of the last days, the Savior taught, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. In other words, many will seek to deceive us by saying that they or their teachings will save us, so there is no need for a Savior or his gospel. The Book of Mormon describes this as the power of the devil to lead away and deceive the hearts of the people to believe that the doctrine of Christ was a foolish and a vain thing. Satan also seeks to deceive us about right and wrong and to persuade us that there is no such thing as sin. This detour typically starts off with what seems to be only a small departure. Just try it once. One beer or one cigarette or one porno movie won't hurt. What all of these departures have in common is that each of them is addictive. Addiction is a condition in which we surrender part of our power of choice. When we do that, we give the devil power over us. The prophet Nephi described where this leads. The devil says there is no hell, and I am no devil, for there is none. And thus he whispereth in their ears until he grasps them with his awful chains, from whence there is no deliverance. If we choose the wrong road, we choose the wrong destination. The prophet Nephi warns against another kind of deception. And others will he pacify and lull them away into carnal security, that they will say, All is well in Zion, yea, Zion prospereth, all is well. And thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them away carefully down to hell. Those who fall for this deception may profess to believe in God, but they do not take his commandments or his justice seriously. They are confident in their own prosperity and conclude that God must have accepted their chosen route. President Russell M. Nelson spoke of the need to teach and help raise a sin-resistant generation. That phrase, a sin-resistant generation, struck a deep spiritual chord within me. We honor children who strive to live pure and obedient lives. I have witnessed the strength of many children throughout the world. They stand resilient, steadfast, and immovable in a variety of challenging circumstances and environments. These children understand their divine identity, feel Heavenly Father's love for them, and seek to obey His will. However, there are children who struggle to stand steadfast and immovable and whose delicate minds are being wounded. They are being attacked on every side by the fiery darts of the adversary and are in need of reinforcement and support. They are an overwhelming motivation for us to step up and wage a war against sin in our effort to bring our children unto Christ. Listen to the words of Elder Bruce R. McConkie nearly 43 years ago. As members of the Church, we are engaged in a mighty conflict. We are at war. We have enlisted in the cause of Christ to fight against Lucifer the great war that rages on every side and which, unfortunately, is resulting in many casualties, some fatal, is no new thing. 
Now, there neither are nor can be any neutrals in this war." End quote. Today, the war continues with increased intensity. The battle touches us all and our children, unfortunately, are on the front lines facing the opposing forces. Thus, the need intensifies for us to strengthen our spiritual strategies. Fortifying children to become sin-resistant is a task and a blessing for parents, grandparents, family members, teachers, and leaders. We each bear responsibility to help. However, the Lord has specifically instructed parents to teach their children to understand the doctrine of repentance, faith in Christ, the Son of the living God, and of baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost, and to pray and to walk uprightly before the Lord. We must understand our and their divine identity and purpose before we can help our children see who they are and why they are here. We must help them know without question that they are sons and daughters of a loving Heavenly Father and that He has divine expectations of them. A standard is a rule of measure by which one determines exactness or perfection. We are to be a standard of holiness for all the world to see. The new revised For the Strength of Youth booklet contains not only standards to live with exactness, but promised blessings if you do so. The words contained in this important booklet are standards for the world, and living these standards will enable you to know what to do to become more like the Savior and to be happy in an ever-darkening world. Living the standards in this booklet will help you qualify for the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. And in the world in which you are living, you will need that companionship to make critical decisions that will determine much of your future success and happiness. Living these standards will help each of you qualify to enter the Lord's holy temples and there receive the blessings and power that await you as you make and keep sacred covenants. The call to arise and shine forth is a call to each of you to lead the world in a mighty cause, to raise the standard and lead this generation in virtue, purity, and temple worthiness. If you desire to make a difference in the world, you must be different from the world. I echo the words of Joseph F. Smith, who said to the women of his day, It is not for you to be led by the young women of the world. It is for you to lead the young women in, of the world in everything that is purifying to the children of men. These words ring true today. As daughters of God, you were born to lead. In the world in which we live, your ability to lead will require the guidance and constant companionship of the Holy Ghost, who will tell you all things what ye should do as you recognize and rely on His guidance and promptings. And since the Holy Ghost does not dwell in unclean temples, each of us will need to take inventory of our habits and our hearts. All of us will need to change something, to repent. As King Lamoni's father stated in the Book of Mormon, I will give away all my sins to know thee. Are we, you and I, willing to do the same? Elder Russell M. Nelson said of you, The influence of the young women of the Church, like a sleeping giant, will awaken, arise, and inspire the inhabitants of the earth as a mighty force for righteousness. Young women, arise and take your place in the glorious events that will shape your future and the future of the world. Now is the time. High on a mountaintop, a banner is unfurled. Ye nations, now look up. It waves to all the world. Young women, you are the banner. Be virtuous and pure. Seek the companionship of the Holy Ghost. Bury your sins and transgressions. Maintain your focus and don't let the fog of moral pollution obscure your goals. Be worthy to enter the temple now. To endure well and not give up amidst the challenges in our journey will require us to have strength beyond our own. We cannot do it alone, but with the Lord's help, our success is assured. 
As a psalmist wrote, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. A central message found in the Book of Mormon is that of deliverance, and specifically the Lord's power to deliver his people. As Alma promised, I would that ye should remember that as much as ye shall put your trust in God, even so much ye shall be delivered out of your trials and your troubles and your afflictions, and ye shall be lifted up at the last day. One story of deliverance is found in Alma chapter 2. The Nephites were experiencing a tremendous period of prosperity and peace. Then one day, a man by the name of Amlici decides that he wants to be king and convinces people to follow him. Once Amlici becomes king, he starts a war with the Nephites. During the first day of the war, over 12,000 Amlicites were killed, as well as 6,000 Nephites. The Nephites decide to rest and pitch their tents in the Valley of Gideon. Alma sends spies to check on the Amlicites. The report comes back that the Lamanites have joined forces with the Amlicites and are attacking the people north of Zarahemla. If Alma and his army do not return to Zarahemla, the Amlicites will certainly overtake the city. They pack up camp and begin to cross the river. As they do so, they are attacked by the Amlicites and Lamanites, who Alma records were as numerous as the sands upon the seashore. Then Alma relates, and this is the key point. Nevertheless, the Nephites, being strengthened by the hand of the Lord, having prayed mightily to him that he would deliver them out of the hands of their enemies, therefore the Lord did hear their cries, and did strengthen them, and the Lamanites and the Amlicites did fall before them. In our life, it may seem that the opposition is as numerous as the sands upon the seashore. We may be encumbered by spiritual bondage and sin, discouragement, disappointment, and weaknesses that hinder our progression, or with responsibilities and burdens that are beyond our own ability to manage. On my bedroom wall hangs a painting of a single woman pulling a handcart across a snowy plain. Sometimes I feel like I am that woman, steadily climbing the hills of life, and yet at times I feel like I am doing it alone. Yet I know God is mindful of me as an individual and is watching over me. Just as the Nephites were strengthened by the hand of the Lord and delivered from their enemies, I and you will, will receive similar strength to pull our load. Each day we have an opportunity to be strengthened by the hand of the Lord. Think about that. Why would anyone choose to wade through life's difficulties alone when the Lord stands at the door and knocks? The Savior himself said, Draw near unto me, and I will draw near unto you. For us to draw near unto the Lord and be strengthened by Him, the first thing we must do is have faith and believe that the Lord can and will strengthen us. In Isaiah, the Lord counsels, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. If we are to be strengthened by the hand of the Lord, we must learn to more effectively control our fears and feelings of discouragement. Then we must trust God and wait for Him. In Hebrew, the phrase to wait means to hope for or anticipate. Consider that definition as we read a verse from Isaiah chapter 40. But they that wait upon the Lord, or hope for or anticipate, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. What does it mean to repent? We begin with the dictionary's definition that to repent is to turn from sin, to feel regret and sorrow. To repent from sin is not easy, but the prize is worth the price. Repentance needs to be done one step at a time. Humble prayer will facilitate each essential step. As prerequisites to forgiveness, there must first be recognition, remorse, then confession. By this you may know if a man repenteth of his sins, behold, he will confess them and forsake them. Confession is to be made to the person who has been wronged. Confession should be sincere and not merely an admission of guilt after proof is evident. 
If many persons have been offended, confession should be made to all offended parties. Acts that may affect one's standing in the Church or the right to its privileges should be confessed promptly to the bishop, whom the Lord has called as a common judge in Israel. The next step is restitution, to repair damage done if possible. Then come steps to resolve to do better and refrain from relapse, to repent with full purpose of heart. Thanks to the ransom paid by the Atonement of Jesus Christ, full forgiveness is given to the sinner who repents and remains free from sin. To the repentant soul, Isaiah said, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. President Marion G. Romney of the First Presidency taught, Is there any doubt that retaining a remission of sins depends on our caring for one another? If we believe these teachings, if we profess to follow the Savior and His prophets, if we want to be true to our covenants and have the Spirit of the Lord in our lives, then we must do the things that the Savior said and did. The purpose of my message is to honor and celebrate what the Lord has done and is doing to serve the poor and the needy among His children on earth. He loves His children in need and also those who want to help. And He has created ways to bless both those who need help and those who will give it. Our Heavenly Father hears the prayers of His children across the earth, pleading for food to eat, clothes to cover their bodies, and for the dignity that would come from being able to provide for themselves. Those pleas have reached Him since He placed men and women on the earth. You learn of those needs where you live and from across the world. Your heart is often stirred with feelings of sympathy. When you meet someone struggling to find employment, you feel that desire to help. You feel it when you go into the home of a widow and see that she has no food. You feel it when you see photographs of crying children sitting in the ruins of their home destroyed by an earthquake or by fire. Because the Lord hears their cries and feels your deep compassion for them, He has from the beginning of time provided ways for His disciples to help. He has invited His children to consecrate their time, their means, and themselves to join with Him in serving others. His way of helping has at times been called living the law of consecration. In another period, His way was called the United Order. In our time, it is called the Church Welfare Program. The names and details of operation are changed to fit the needs and conditions of people. But always the Lord's way to help those in need in temporal need requires people who, out of love, have consecrated themselves and what they have to God and to His Word. He has invited and commanded us to participate in His work to lift up those in need. We have a covenant to do that in the waters of baptism and in the holy temples of God. We renew the covenant on Sundays when we partake of the sacrament. This group provides videos to help encourage gospel study. This is not an official church site. The materials used are all provided by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Salt Lake City, Utah, and those videos and images used under license through a subscription to CyberLink PowerDirector, unless otherwise noted.